Good morning, everyone. It's good to see your smiling faces. Let us worship God together. O oh, gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you. Give us eyes to see you and a heart to meditate on you. Seems like an amen goes there, doesn't it? Let us sing together new songs of celebration. Loving God, as we worship you today, let not our hearts be as hard as stone, but make us soft 
and pliable as clay. Let not our minds be armored as a fortress, but make us as open as an archway. Let us not cling to preconceived assumptions, but relax our hands to let go of all to which we grasp. Set us free to hold whatever you might send us. May we not be like rocks, unaffected amid the current, unconnected to its source. Instead, may we flow with your spirit as a fallen leaf floats lightly on the surface of a stream. We pray in Jesus' name as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Yes, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. For the Lord is high above the nations, his glory is higher than the heavens. He stoops to look down on heaven and on earth. He lifts the poor from the dust and the needy from the garbage dump. He sets them on princes, even the princes of his own people. He gives a childless woman a family, making her a happy mother. Praise the Lord. Lindsay? So today for American Sign Language, we're going to actually kind of review three symbols, uh, sorry, three signs that we've used before. Jesus, Jesus, loves, and then us, us. So we're going to do that all together. Ready? Jesus loves us. We had a wonderful pasta dinner last night, thanks to all of those who contributed items and time and your presence. Um, we have $443 that was brought in for the pasta dinner. We've received a note. Anybody recognize that building here in Warren? Maxwell House. September 17, 2019. Dear Pastor Irish, thank you so much for participating in the National Day of Healing on August 25th. The Warren Middle Passage Project was honored to be part of the ceremony with the bell ringing at the Baptist Church. Please accept this donation as a token of our appreciation and gratitude. Sincerely, Chris W. McDonald, who I assume is a treasurer, since the check was signed by her. How many of you received this in the mail? It even came to us in, an, uh, in Massachusetts. Boss coughs. Um, Some of the things that they will be doing, they have a community room within their store that if we wanted to do something, we could say, is your community room free at this time? But 
On September 28th to 5th, Debbie Boone will be there. On October 6th through 12th, Elvis Aaron Presley Jr. will be there. So there are things that they will do that will make community lighter. <laughs> Debbie? I want to say, uh, I just want to tell you, Facebook is called Debbie Tribute. There is almost every Friday night, there's a Debbie Tribute Facebook page. And there's a lot of programs. They are going all out. and having met some of them personally. If, if they hadn't been the kind of people they were, I probably wouldn't have been interested. But not just this time, but throughout the year, they will do things that will put money into our nonprofits. And if a company is willing to do that, I'm willing to support them in the doing of it. To, uh, where most Nonprofits are in similar situations to where we are. We're not alone in that because of debt, because of the economy, because of there's just not enough funds to go around for our nonprofits. So having a company move in that knows that and wants to support us. Yes, we have to do something in order to get their money, which is a good thing. It's better than giving it to us as a handout. But um, there are still tickets available. Kevin has some in the office if you were interested and haven't gotten one yet. If you did take tickets and have sold any, uh, we would appreciate having the money turned in. At this point, Debbie has done that and uh, has a few people going with her, which we greatly appreciate. And our September mission is in, uh, continuing our August mission. On October 6th, there will be an Abquarry All Church Worship at the Memorial Baptist Church of Seekonk. So it's, it's on our side of the state, even though it's in Massachusetts. Um, and you are very welcome to go. We are still looking for Sunday school teachers and see where we, we can go on that. Okay, I, and I want to let you know, the craft fair is coming up. Laurel is working hard on it, but there are things that we do in addition to what Laurel do, does. So if you have any questions, you can talk to Wanda and Priscilla here and Mike when he's here um, to see if there are things that you can do to help in the whole process. Wanda. October 20th, we need foods for the bake sale as the craft fair is going on. Now this is the time of the Warren walkabout. So there will be a lot of people in town and we want to entice as many as we can to see who we are as a church. Psalm 79, nine. Help us, O God, of our salvation. Help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. If the ushers would come forward and receive our morning tithes and offerings.
thank you for your faithfulness. We are so grateful that we can always count on you. Out of your abundance and great mercy, you have given us so much. And so we give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Take it now and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply its reach and influence, we pray. May be, it be a great blessing to many. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. And I then shall live. Our scripture reading today is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Instructions about worship. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf. 
and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peacefully and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom from everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I have been chosen as a preacher, an apostle, to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth. I'm not exaggerating, just telling the truth. <laughs> Oh God, we come to you with gratitude and praise that you are our Savior. Though our lives do not always reflect our gratitude, you desire that we lead quiet and peaceable lives instead of our busy days, which are filled with distractions and where we fail to be aware of your presence. We are really not worthy of the many gifts you give us through your constant love. Have mercy on us. Help us to respond more fully to your love and to grow in godliness. We notice that Priscilla Drummond is not with us today. Usually she's here every Sunday. So it's with love and concern in our hearts that we lift her before you. We thank you for her faithfulness and for your faithfulness. And because of your faithfulness, we trust that today you will be with her, that you will give her what is needed. As our scripture reminded us today to pray for each other for everyone that we know, but also to pray for those in authority. As so we lift before you President Trump, asking that your good and perfect will might be done in his life and carried over 
into our country's life. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have come to join in worship. Psalm 79, 1 through 9. O God, pagan nations have conquered your land, your special possession. They have defiled your holy temple and made Jerusalem a heap of ruins. They have left the bodies of your servants as food for the birds of heaven. The flesh of your godly ones has become food for wild animals. Blood has flowed like water all around Jerusalem. No one is left to bury the dead. We are mocked by our neighbors, an object of scorn and derision to those around us. Oh Lord, how long will you be angry with us? Forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that refuse to acknowledge you, on kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured your people Israel, making the land a desolate wilderness. Do not hold us guilty for the sins of our ancestors. Let your compassion quickly meet our needs, for we are on the brink of despair. 
Help us, O God of our salvation. Help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. Most people want to be prepared in the case of an emergency. We are better able to prepare for those occasional situations in which we need help. Our smartphones have apps we can use to summon help. In today's dramatic psalm reading, we can hear the urgency of the words. The situation is serious. Will God arrive in time to save the psalmist and his people? The first ocean-going vessel to use an SOS distress signal was not, as many believe, the Titanic in April 1912. In fact, the wireless operator on the Titanic, Jack Phillips, sent out a CQD call, which was still widely used at the time. It was only when no help appeared that he began to send an SOS signal interspersed with the CQD call. For the passengers and crew of the steamer Kentucky, the SOS single was a lifesaver. Back on February 4, 1910, almost 110 years ago, the Kentucky set sail around Cape Horn from New York to Tacoma, Washington. A little bit about Morse code SOS. Uh, he was a relative of mine, but our friend and neighbor, Andy Ferrante. He competes nationally and I believe internationally in SOS competitions. Not many people do that today. But back to the Kentucky. According to one source, it ran into heavy weather outside the Virginia Capes and began to leak badly, faster than the pumps could control. At this point, an SOS signal went out to a nearby ship, the Alamo, it responded, and they were able to save all passengers and crew before the ship went down. Pilots of aircraft do not send out SOS signals. You know that, right? What do they send out? Mayday, mayday. And anyone receiving this message knows the aircraft is in serious trouble. The general population, which is unlikely to have the helm of a ship in their hands or be at the controls of a Boeing 787 Dreamliner, will employ different means to alert authorities or friends of a perilous situation. What's our most common distress single signal that we use right now? 911. Or they might use an SOS app on their phone, their smartphone. It has an auto call feature and a list of emergency contacts you can notify when in distress. Another cool app, however, is in case of emergency app or ICE. Now, I have used ICE in front of Rick and our kids' names for many years, but it was only in studying for this that I discovered it's also on the cell phone. All they have to do is turn your phone on, whether it's locked or whatever, and the, whoops, didn't stay there. In case of emergency, they touch that, and they can, without unlocking my phone or anything, they can, anyone who has a ha app, it's there. This app, according to the product description, stores important information for first responders and hospital staff to use in case of emergency involving you. It also includes a list of people to call. You can call directly from the app. Hopefully you've put their picture in and you touch the button and the call is on the way. Insurance information, doctor names and numbers. They, again, they can be called directly from the app allergies, medical conditions, medications, and any special instructions or other information that you wish to supply. You decide all the way how much or how little you put in. 
Anyone can use this app when the phone is locked by pattern, pin, or password. The ICE lock screen also includes an optional if found message. In case you lose your phone, then without getting into anything more, they can find out who the phone belongs to. But let's get back to our scripture text. It was a horrifying scene. The writer of today's lament must have lost his phone because he's totally at a loss what to do. He does know that he calls out to God. The psalm has been called the funeral dirge of the nation. From the viewpoint of the writer, he is a witness to one of the most jarring, unbelievable events in history. It's a calamity so momentous that the Bible mentions it in four different places in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 25, 2 Chronicles 36, which means we're going to get to it very, well, not immediately, but quite soon in our adult class. Jeremiah 39 and Jeremiah 52. Jerusalem has fallen to the Babylonian invaders. Although some of his countrymen have been unceremoniously carted off to Babylon, as was in the case with Daniel, many, if not most, of the inhabitants have been slaughtered. Even more horrifying is the dead are lying where they fell. The writer can see with his own eyes the vultures circling overhead. He sees them hopping from one corpse to another, plucking and eating human flesh as though they were eating a deer or a rabbit. Packs of dogs are likewise hunting and feasting on his neighbors. The bloodshed is so heavy that the blood literally runs down the streets of Jerusalem in rivulets, pooling here and there. Can you imagine the smell? It's an unthinkable nightmare of apocalyptic proportions. The writer is beside himself. We have a become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. Help us, O God, of our salvation for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. The writer needs an ICE app. Now, going back to the app, It has two types of message that the user, the person in distress, can send. The instant message and the delayed message. The instant message is only a tap away. All you need to do is tap a button and a message is sent to one of your emergency contacts. This message will include such information as your GPS location, Now, a century ago, the wireless operator of Kentucky sent longitude and latitude. We are sinking. Our latitude is 32 degrees, 10 minutes. Longitude, 76 degrees, 30 minutes. The message will also contain a pre-composed message that you need help. Your emergency context may be linked to a photo so that there was no confusion as who to contact. This is a type of emergency message we love to use with God. After all, isn't that what many people think God is there for? To save us, to be there for us, to leap to our rescue whenever needed. It's sort of like the Edwardian dowager clad in a fancy tea gown who's having her dinner alone in the great hall. She's seated in a padded chair, uncomfortable because of her boned corset. Perhaps this is why she spills soup on her fancy silk dress. She lifts her dainty hands and rings a bell, or perhaps she pulls a cord. Instantly, the butler is at her side, wiping soup stains off her dress and cleaning up her mess. How often do you think of God, our butler, there when needed and out 
of sight the rest of the time so that he doesn't interfere in our lives. Then we have the delayed message. If the message is delayed, it gives us even more to think about. Here's what one does when choosing to send a delayed message using the ISAP. We have to choose the contact, enter the subject, enter your message, enable GPS tracking, choose the send time, and then add delayed message to the queue. So we'll go by these step by step. Our real ICE contact would be God. The message could be, help us, O God, of our salvation, or out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. Or be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Now, God has given us each one of those phrases, and he's very happy for us to use them. Actually, he likes us to use them more than not use them. Of course, he wants us to really mean it when we say them. God has agreed to be our emergency contact. Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. And then you enter your subject. Your subject line is the mess that you're in. And then the message. This is where you explain the nature of your difficulty. When we're at the onset of an emergency, we might explain that trouble is brewing. But if we've waited to call on God when we're already in a full-blown crisis, then we need to give God the pertinent details. In some ways, this amounts to a confession. Like a 911 operator, God wants to keep you on the line. He wants you to keep that connection to him. Your emergency contact needs to know the particulars. You don't need to tell anyone else, but you do need to tell God. Spill your guts. Let God know what's going on in your heart. Admit any wrongdoing. This helps God to understand that you're in a spiritual and emotional state to be rescued. Your contrition and confession lets God know that you're actually willing to receive assistance. Attach a photo to your message. In other words, give God an accurate assessment of who you are. This too will help God identify you as someone who knows there's trouble and wants to be delivered from that trouble. And then you enabled your GPS tracking. Now this could be God's power system or God's protective services. You want God to be able to track you. So you invite God to search me, O oh God, know my heart, test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me out of the mess as soon as possible. That wasn't in the scripture, but by your smiles, I recognize you got that. Choose the send time. Schedule your crisis. Sometimes, as we look at the week ahead, we know we're going to need a special portion of God's grace. Yes, we know that we need God every minute, every hour and every day of our lives, but really, there are those special times when the stress factor is going to be huge, and we know it. So we send out a call to God in which we acknowledge that we might be weak, that the force that's about to be applied to our patients just might be too much for us to handle while keeping our cool, that it's possible that we are going to buckle under pressure, it's like we're asking God to be on standby for an emergency.
emergency rescue for an infusion of or transfusion of something of grace, wisdom, power, self-control, or all of the above. And then we add this delayed message to the queue. We pray it out, we lay it out, then click send and walk away. Because once we do that, it is in God's hands, and we need to keep our hands off. Sometimes the rescue is dynamic. Such was the case with Joyce Smith. Last spring, I told you about the movie Breakthrough based on the book she wrote about her son. Rick and I went to the movie and Sue brought, bought the books, book. She loaned it to me. Now from spring to now, I finally had time to read it and I was going to bring it today. And I remembered everything else I needed except for the book. But I will try to bring it in and Sue, it, doesn't need it back, so she's willing for it to be shared among the congregation so that you can read it. The movie was wonderful, but the book is even more powerful. She writes, or in the book it says, when her 14-year-old son John fell through an icy Missouri lake one winter morning, she and her family had seemingly lost everything. He was underwater too long. And then at the hospital, John lay lifeless for more than 60 minutes. But Joyce was not ready to give up on her son. She mustered all her faith and strength into one force and cried out to God in a loud voice to save him. Miraculously, her son's heart immediately started beating again. In the coming days, John would defy every expert, every case history, and every scientific prediction. 16 days after falling through the ice and being clinically dead in the hospital, that didn't account the time they worked on him beside the lake or the time that they were transporting him because the hospital wasn't really close. In the hospital, he was dead for an hour. You know what that means but he walked out of the hospital on his own power, completely healed. Smith told the story in her book subtitled, The Miraculous True Story of a Mother's Faith and Her Child's Resurrection. The book was made into a movie which, which re was released last spring over Easter weekend. In chapter 17, she writes, we had experienced miracles. They would find out what the problem of the day was. They would send out a prayer request and the pastors were there praying. And all of a sudden, it was no longer a problem. I knew God was there and working behind the scenes. I'd focused on speaking life and clinging to that faith as small as a mustard seed that faith that can move mountains, that faith that God loves to see in his children. Somehow I knew if John was to get through this, it would be because of faith. And she continues talking about faith, saying, in my Bible study group, we had just finished studying Beth Moore's The Patriarchs. While we were learning about Old Testament patriarchs of the faith, I found myself deeply wanting to know and understand why God so highly favored Abraham and why Abraham's faith was so strong. Abraham said, had such faith that no matter what God asked him to do, he didn't question it. He just did it. When God asked him to leave his homeland of Ur and move to a place that God didn't reveal, Abraham got up and moved. What was it that Abraham did so that he could be called friend of God? And why did he trust God so emphatically that he would do anything God asked him to do? It wasn't that Abraham was perfect. To protect himself against a foreign ruler, he lied about his wife, not once, but twice. He let his wife talk him into sleeping with another woman in order to get her pregnant, a decision that still has consequences for us. So it wasn't that God was faithful to him because Abraham never messed up. It simply came down to trust. 
Abraham trusted God. Joyce continues writing, I wanted to embrace and practice the kind of faith that Abraham had. That faith was the key to my boldness to pray for John without doubting that God could answer my prayers. I didn't have to know the answers. I didn't have to see the end results. I just had to trust God, believe that he is always faithful, he is always working, and he is always good. Many of you experienced God's faithfulness after Howie Huftalan's accident. You prayed and prayed. He didn't have complete healing, but he's still walking amidst us. How many years later? 50 years later? Wow. But this summer you forgot, Lee, forgot that God leads. God is faithful and we are here to serve him and not ourselves. Put God back in first place, remembering that you don't always know what he's doing in your own life and you do not know what God is asking others to accomplish. Our purpose for being is to put God first. But there are times when help doesn't come. The psalmist didn't receive the deliverance he asked for. The Babylonian armies under Nebuchadnezzar hit the kingdom of Judah in three invasions. And after the third, in 586 BC, the country and Jerusalem was in ruins. It would be years before any of the captives would be allowed to return, and most of them never did, preferring to remain in the life they had created in their new host country. After all, had this not been the place the prophet had advised them to go? Was this not the word of God to them? Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Really, they probably didn't see this coming. This was an answer to their prayers, but it wasn't the answer they were expecting. Often what's frustrating is that God doesn't seem to work too hard on a particular response time. It's not like paramedics whose goal is to arrive at a scene within minutes of getting the call. That's why that answer was so fast this morning. Sometimes when we call upon the Lord, we get an instant response. Sometimes we get a delayed response. Listen to the cry of the psalmist in Psalm 13. We can hear the pain in his voice. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Sometimes a response comes to us in ways we did not expect. Sometimes we don't think we get a response at all. But through it all, we learn to trust the one into whose hands we place our lives. Perhaps when we do this, we can say as the prophet Habakkuk did, though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on its vine, though the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I would exalt in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, my strength, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He makes me tread upon the heights. Let us pray. Oh Lord, when we think about this passage from Habakkuk, we're very good at enumerating the top, saying everything that is wrong, everything that is missing. May our response be to praise you, to worship you, to recognize that you are still in control, and 
have to pray that as time unfolds, we may be able to see the great work that you are doing in our midst. Amen. Come and find the quiet center. singing that song, I realized something else that Joyce said and enforced. No one was to speak the bad at all. They could only speak what they wanted as the results. I'm going to ask you to try that at least this week. And if it works for you, keep doing it. The blessing of the Lord is upon you. We go forth in gladness. You are beloved children of God. We go forth in confidence. The Spirit of God watches over you. We go forth in peace. Amen. Amen.